All right, my name is Lucas Tuber. I'm a speech language pathologist based out of Portland, Oregon. I'm the CEO of a little clinic and consulting company here called LanguageCraft. And I also started a fun training website for augmentative and alternative communication with some friends of mine named Avaz. Uh, it's called Discover AAC, discoveraac.org. And we've got some neat um, content, not only to learn about AAC, but also some fun interactive games um, to learn more about how to interact uh, with folks that are using AAC. But that is not what I'm here to talk about today. So when I go to set up a new augmentative communication device for a child in particular, um, what I find is that a lot of teachers and certainly parents aren't familiar with all of the awesome accessibility options that already exist within iOS. So I want to talk a little bit about what those are, um, not only the ones that have been around for a little bit, but also some things that are new with iOS 9. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the settings here. So when I choose the settings, for me it's defaulting now into uh, general. So as I go down, we'll see you know basic things like about, software update, Siri, which is the voice recognition app. We see accessibility here. Um, I'm going to go back to that in a moment. But notice down below right now in the blue bar at the bottom, I have both Safari and the camera. So the first thing that I want to talk about actually is restrictions. So if we go down here about halfway down the page, uh, we'll see this uh, restrictions icon. I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to go ahead and enable restrictions. And um, my password will be 1234. I would encourage you not to use that one. Kids seem to figure that one out pretty quick. Um, but this is something that comes up pretty often. So if we want to, for example, disallow internet access, or I've seen, I know a lot of kids that uh, really will um, focus a lot on taking pictures of themselves and others. So we'll turn that one off, turn off FaceTime turn off the iTunes store, or perhaps the ability to uh, delete apps, and then also in-app purchases. Um, so this is a, a real easy way um, to immediately make, make your life a little bit easier um, in terms of managing the use of the iPad. So now when I go back out, you notice those two things are gone. So there's no more access now to the camera or to Safari. Um, I want to make a comment, though, based on the augmentative communication lens, that we really do want um, an iPad that's used for communication to be used only for communication, because this reinforces its um, you know, power as a communicative device and lets a kid really see it as you know, something they use to communicate with the world. Um, however, uh, coming outside of the augmentative communication lens, um, some of these restrictions can be useful for any child, um, any user of a device, um, and also particularly if there is a second iPad that is used for recreational purposes, um, sometimes those restrictions can be useful. So, going back into settings here, um, now I want to take a look at accessibility, which is the main thing that I want to talk about today. So when we go into accessibility, there's a whole bunch of different options. So the first category we see here is vision. So voiceover uh, would read uh, text that's on the screen if necessary. Zoom, uh, of course, would zoom in on the screen if necessary. We have the option also to invert colors or to display them in grayscale, which actually can be kind of nice for people like me who are colorblind. Makes me better at certain games. Um, we can enlarge the size of text, we can bold it, uh, we can increase the contrast on the screen, um, and other options like this that can make it uh, visually easier to access the device. Um, when I get down to interaction here, I do want to talk a moment about switch control. So. Um, iOS relatively recently uh, has enabled the ability to control to be controlled with uh, with switches, and there's a whole variety of options here that I'm not going to get into because that would be a much longer conversation. But for a child that needs to access, or an adult who needs to access a device using switches, there's a variety of different ways um, that we can do that. We can do that with single switches um, in a variety of ways. And it's you know and it gives giving an example here of how it would be scanning through. So a single switch with this sort of scan, what it would do is activate the place on the screen where oh, let me turn it off now um, where that bar is scanning. So here we have an example, and then we can hit the switch again to activate the subcategory uh, vertically that we've activated uh, that we've uh, chosen. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off switch control, but I want you to know that this is something that's available. Um, please do feel free to contact me if you have need of more information about switch control because there's a lot of really amazing tools out there now. All right, so touch accommodations, this is something that's new to iOS 9 and it's really a fantastic thing for a lot of the kids that I work with. 
So it looks like I already had this one enabled. So typically by default, this would be turned off. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on. So hold duration is the first option here. So this is the amount of time that you need to touch the screen before the touch is recognized. Um, so very often I will have kids that sort of will wail on the screen a little bit or touch it over and over again um, when they're really not making a meaningful choice. So if we need for them to hold for a moment for motor reasons or otherwise, then we can turn on this whole duration. See now in order to turn it up even, it's making me hold down for 0.3 seconds, now 0.35. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. Um, you also could see um, how it's sort of counting, uh, counting down around my thumb to show how long it takes. Ignore repeat is another option. So this is the duration of time where multiple touches could be treated as a single touch. So if we have um, you know, a user who maybe has some motor control issues, who's gonna have some problems holding their finger in one spot for a long period of time, um, we can set an amount of time during which multiple touches are treated as a single touch. So you, know, you can tap on something a number of times without activating it a whole bunch of times, you just activate it the once. Um, and then finally, we have tap assistance down here at the bottom. So this would be useful in a case where we have a child that maybe will start at one spot on the screen because of inaccurate motor control and then finish, for example, uh, at the location of the icon that they actually want to activate. Um, so again, these are all brand new features with iOS 9 and I'm really excited they've added them because in the past some individual app developers have had to sort of hack their way through um, similar accommodations, but now that we have them built in, um, then that means they're available for everybody. So um, keyboarding, um, I want to just briefly comment. They've added key repeat, sticky keys, and also slow keys um, to Bluetooth keyboard access uh, in this version as well. So key repeat um, would mean that if somebody's tapping the same key multiple times, um, that it's not going to make a whole series of the letter K or whatever it might be, again, with motor control. Sticky keys would allow a modifier to be set without having to hold it down. So what that means is perhaps the command key or the option key or the control key, you could hit that once and then hit you know the letter Q. So command Q would often quit out of an app. And then finally, slow keys adjust the amount of time um, that it takes to activate a key. So you know if a user needs to hold a key down for a little bit um, or if they're often holding many keys down, um, this will make sure that the key press is a little bit more intentional. Um, okay, so the big one. So we want to get down to guided access. So at the bottom of this, uh, we have this guided access option, which I'm going to turn on. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and set a passcode again. We'll go with 1234, my super secret passcode. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not my PIN number. So normally, when you hit the home button on an iPad, which is really the one button on the face of it, um, it'll take you back to the home screen. If you double click the home icon, it'll give you a list of the different apps that are already open. Um, this does look a little bit different in iOS 9, so you can scroll through these left to right. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the settings now, by which I'm gonna just flip it up towards the screen. And then I'm gonna go into an augmentative communication app. So I'm gonna choose Avaz because they're my friends and I work with them a lot. So here we have, um, you know, essentially the starting point of this particular app in terms of augmentative communication. So for example, if we wanted to make sure that a child um, is just using this for communication, what we would do is triple click and then we get this guided access menu. So there's a variety of options here. Um, I'm gonna go down to hardware buttons so we can do things like turn off or on the sleep wake button, turn off or on the volume buttons, turn off or on motion control, um, and then turn off or on the ability for keyboards to come up. These last two don't matter with this particular app, but if, for example, you want to set um, you know, the app at a certain volume, make sure it's not being turned up or down, then, um, then that's an option. We can keep that turned off. And then the sleep wake button. This is a good one. I, I, I do know a fair number of kids that um, really will we'll sort of run over and turn the iPad back on if the screen dims. And so uh, just um, not having that active uh, can be a good idea because it keeps uh, the screen active. So we'll go ahead and go with that. We can enable or disable touch. Um, of course, in this case, you see it's all grayed out. That would prevent uh, the child from accessing the device. So we don't want to do that. Um, and that's what I'm going to show for now here. Now, so now I'm in guided access. And so what that means is if I hit that home button, it's going to say guided access is enabled, triple click the home button to exit. 
I could try to double click, no, nope, you get the same result. However, in this case, a child could still get into the settings and sort of mess around with stuff. So there's a fun way to get around that as well. So what I'm gonna do is triple click again. It's gonna ask me for my top secret one, two, three, four password. And then what I can do is actually use my finger and trace around the area that I don't want someone to be able to access. You can see these little dots here. I'm grabbing that one on the left and moving it a little bit. I'm gonna move the one up on the right a little bit. So where it's grayed out, this is showing you the area that they can't be clicked. So now, when we go back in, all of a sudden we can't get into the settings and these other things. Um, this app actually does allow you to, to set a passcode to get into those things anyway. Um, but guided access is a really simple way to do this in, in any app to sort of lock off certain portions. Um, so there are other applications of guided access. This, um, you know, what I use it most frequently for is with augmentative communication. But we're going to end guided access here which means I now can go to the home button by clicking it once. Of course, I have a variety of augmentative communication apps here for trialing with different students. If I double click it, then again, we'll get a list of the open applications. So I'm done with Abaz now, so I'm gonna go ahead and flick up and get rid of it. And I will pull up everybody's favorite thing, at least the kids I work with, which is Minecraft. Um, so again, like I said at the beginning, we really do want um, a communication device to be a dedicated device, meaning that it's only used for communication. Um, however, uh, that's not always the way things happen in the classroom or at home, and very often kids will have uh, another iPad that they use, or this could be applicable to um, you know kids that aren't communication users at all. So if I go back into Guided Access, I'm going to triple click. Um, what I really love with games and things like this is this time limit option in the lower right. So what I can do is I can set this to say five minutes. That's the amount of time that the student is able to access this and then go back to start. So now they're gonna be able to play Minecraft for five minutes and then when that's done, it's gonna go ahead and lock the iPad and you'll be once again required to put in the guided access password. And I like that a lot because it doesn't make me the bad guy it makes the iPad a bad guy. All right, once again, this is Lucas Stuber from LanguageCraft, um, also from discoveryac.org. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, please email me, lucas at languagecraft.org, if you have any questions at all, um, and feel free also to find us online.